Good afternoon in Washington. Good evening in Europe, in Ukraine, in Russia. My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Today we have a wonderful event for you, a front page event of global leaders. And we have with us a very, very interesting global leader today, Mihail Hodorkovsky, the founder of Open Russia, a long-term businessman, very successful businessman in Russia, and the leader of, you might say, those who want to see an open society in Russia. And with that, um, we will begin our conversation. Uh, Mr. Hodorkovsky, perhaps more than almost anyone else, you have an understanding of what's on Putin's mind. Uh, now that his war in Ukraine, this massive escalation, has not gone well, what do you think that Putin will do next? <laughs> For him, a, a, a bad option would be to not win Ukraine. The Russian authorities, uh, Russian powers, when they lose a war, traditionally, historically experience big problems uh, in approximately two years after such a non-victory. Uh, Nevertheless, the, the Ukrainian resistance is showing Putin that there is no good choice. You can choose to either lose on the front or make make believe that you've won i think that in the end the decision is going to be made to make it look like we won pretend that we won but uh, before that i'm afraid uh, for the U U ukrainians the ukrainian military face a few more weeks of having to show uh, a firmness what would be something to make a show that he won when perhaps he hasn't. What, what would fit that need for him? Uh, for Russian society, Putin and his propaganda machine will be able to sell yeah. the preservation of se separate districts of, of the Lugansk and uh, uh, Donetsk oblasts and the neutral status of Ukraine, irrespective of, the, of what it would actually mean. He'll be able to sell that as a victory. On the other hand, the already uh, existing part, uh, uh, aggressive part of Russian society and, and Putin's inner circle will be satisfied only with the capture of Kyiv and and the replacement of those of the power in Kyiv. I don't think they're going to achieve that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure like everyone else, you paid close attention to the video of Putin meeting with his national security team just before this new invasion. And then the video of Putin meeting with the defense minister Shoigu and the top general Gerasimov shortly after the major invasion. And all, both of those videos no one in the room seemed to be smiling. It, it almost seems as if this was Putin's decision to escalate and maybe his advisors were, were stunned and maybe not supportive. Do you think that's true? Because you, you talk about an aggressive component of the Russian population, an aggressive component of his uh, his entourage. Uh, how serious is that, that entourage? In other words, the aggressive part of that entourage. Well, look, we can see this quite easily based on the results of the Istanbul negotiations. We could see how ag aggressively this attempt to test public opinion with respect to a uh, retreat, how, how it was perceived. We can see that Putin in his traditional manner, tested out this possibility with someone else's hands. His propaganda has already created such momentum that he, it'll be difficult for him to retreat, but he'll have to. Okay, thank you. Um, polls run by the Levada Center show that Putin's popularity now is over 80%. 
and that 75% or more of the Russian people support this new invasion. Um, how do you interpret that? Yeah. Uh, I've spoken with a Lord, large number of skilled sociologists and asked them to conduct a real sociological research study. They told me that this is impossible because under a dictatorship, and all the more so during wartime, such research is just not conducted. And, and you can easily understand why. Uh, research is always a voluntary, surveys are voluntary. And usually two out of 10 people agree to be surveyed to whom uh, the survey uh, uh, is offered. Uh, usually these 2% do reflect the uh, average of public opinion, but under a dictatorship, and especially in wartime, these two people are only those who want to formulate a socially acceptable or acceptable to the dictatorship opinion. So to judge about the whole population from these two people is impossible, absolutely. Um, NATO is reporting that Russian combat troops have suffered at least 7,000 deaths and perhaps as many as 15,000 deaths. Even 7,000 is a very large number for such a short war. Um, what impact are these casualty figures, if any, having in Russia? I, I very much regret to say that the value of human life in Russia to this day is not as, as high as one would like to see it be, especially when we're talking about people who live in the North Caucasus or people who live in tiny villages and settlements. Knowing this, Putin is taking his soldiers specifically from those places, and he pays such money for their deaths that by the, by the yardsticks of these re regions, force their close relatives to keep their mouths shut. I think that for another time still, Putin will continue to be able to allow himself this, but not for long. The Russian army, according to many uh, military experts in Ukraine, essentially has been shattered. There's a military statistic which says, if 15% of your force is taken from the field, that force is not able to conduct offensive operations. And if 7,000 Russian soldiers have died, for sure 15% have been taken off the field between dead, wounded, and prisoners. Uh, for Moscow to conduct a new offensive in Ukraine, Putin will have to bring in additional soldiers. We know he's looking for soldiers in the Middle East. We're hearing reports he's withdrawing Russian regiments from, from Southern Ossetia and Georgia, from Tajikistan and elsewhere. My question for you is this, if he's going to conduct a new offensive, uh, he'll need another 100,000 or more soldiers, probably more. Is it possible for him to conscript those soldiers? And is this a political vulnerability for him? Uh, Without any doubt whatsoever, such a step, if Putin is forced to take it, that is to, to conscript maybe 200,000 or so reservists, is going to be politically extremely heavy for him. How heavy? Today, nobody could predict. Yes, to, uh, to call up such a quantity of people is something that he could do, and even more. I think that he could call up a million people. But then um, big cities are going to en end up in coffins, big cities where the op opinion, public opinion is entirely different as to the value of human life. And for Putin, that will be a, a serious problem on the eve of a transition of power that uh, he faces in 2024. I, I want to follow it just a little bit farther. Uh, Putin has been playing games with the threat of nuclear 
activity, a uh, nuclear strike. And you hear Pskov, the spokesman for the Kremlin, and other Russian officials saying, well, for example, uh, Ukraine is holding, having NATO bases or Ukraine becoming part of NATO is an existential threat to Russia. Uh, at the same time, you are saying, so therefore for Putin to win in Ukraine would seem to be an existential issue for him. But you are saying that he is reluctant, at least at this point, to call up the forces he needs for another offensive in Ukraine because there are political dangers for him hmm. in the country. Uh, isn't it strange if in fact he considers Ukraine's geopolitical position an existential matter for him that he's unwilling to call up those forces? At least now. То, что Путин начинал войну, Путин began the war based on uh, faulty presumptions, is perfectly obvious today to everybody. И для самого Путина, for Putin himself, and we can see this from his relations with both those FSB officers who were responsible for preparing for the invasion and with his uh, with his army structures i deem that if putin had assumed such an organized and tough resistance if he had presumed that maybe he might not have decided to start such a war but he felt that he will be met there if not with flowers but at least there wouldn't be any organized resistance. And that was a huge mistake. And now, a good way out of this big mistake, well, there is none, is there? Okay, thank you. Um, as I'm sure you know, the White House has refused to help send uh, MiG fighters to Ukraine uh, and to take other strong steps of support for Ukraine because of fears that Putin would find it quote unquote provocative, and that could lead to a nuclear standoff or worse. Um, critics say that this means Putin is deterring the West, the United States in particular, from defending Ukraine adequately and from defending its own interests. What do you think about this? Uh, in my opinion, there are two uh, misunderstandings in Europe and America. The first misunderstanding is that Europe, especially America less so, is saying we're not fighting. This is not our war. And assume that Putin perceives this in the same way. In actuality, Putin has already said more than once and his propaganda has been saying it that and, and this is how russian society sees it that, that the war on the territory of ukraine is specifically with the united states and and specifically with nato and this it's not our war thing really sounds a lot like an ostrich trying to hide its head in the sand but it's not sand it, it's a concrete floor now, the second problem that also people don't think about all that often, uh, pushing the red button uh, for a nuclear war. For Putin, it's not, uh, that does not mean that pushing the button will launch the missiles. It's, it's a vote of confidence in him on the part of the generals, because this is a command and it has to be carried out. But if it is not carried out, then the only way out from there is death. Death, either for Putin personally or for the generals who refuse to follow orders. And I am nearly 100% convinced that right now Putin is uh, prepared for this vote of, of confidence uh, in himself far less than he was even a month ago. From, from your lips to God's ears. Yes. Okay. Uh, if Putin 
is able to achieve some sort of diplomatic settlement, if, it, if it, well, actually, let me put it another way. Uh, what, coming back to this, what do you think Putin does next? Do you think there's going to be another offensive in Ukraine? I would say this offensive has pretty much been stopped. Is there going to be another offensive by Russia in Ukraine? I, I think that in order to, uh, uh, to have a real uh, real negotiations, uh, peace negotiations, because Putin's not ready for those yet, in my opinion. I think that before that, that, that he and, and the, the crazy people in his entourage are going to try once again to resolve the problem in a military fashion. Likely, this will be an attempt to s surround the troops uh, that are in Donbass. Perhaps there might be some, some other uh, steps and attempts, but I think that Ukraine, the Ukrainian troops are st still uh, facing a, a need to show, show their toughness. Further, if in fact there's another offensive, and if that offensive fails to achieve new victories, uh, then you're thinking Putin would be ready for a diplomatic settlement. I would like to think so, yes. If in fact, well, let's, let's just um, speculate a little bit. If in fact, for example, they reach an agreement where Russia retains at least the independence of the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics, or at least this is not, this is not contested, uh, and there's a ceasefire. Do you think that ends the conflict between Putin and Ukraine? Or what, what comes next? Uh, I am convinced that until, or as long as Putin remains in power, peace on the European continent will not exist. For four times already, Putin has been solving his political problems within the country through aggression. This was in 1999, in 2008, in 2014, and now it, was, it has been in 2022. Even if he convinces Russian society that he is one, that will give him a little bit of breathing room, but not much, because the, the crazy ones in his entourage will feel uh, the taste of blood and are going to pre press further. And the result of this will be a new war. Now, it is another matter that if right now he manages to win in Ukraine, which, which I don't believe will happen, but if, uh, hopefully not, then the next war will be on NATO countries' territories, most likely the Baltics. If he can't win in Ukraine, then he will try once again to attack Ukraine. So for this reason, as long as Putin is in power, stability on the European continent is an impossibility. That Article 5, right, which, which commits each NATO member to defend other members of NATO, will not deter a victorious in U Putin in Ukraine from attacking the Baltic members of NATO. I already said, this is a dramatic mistake that exists in the heads of Western leaders. They think that Putin sees this war as a war with Ukraine only. This is not so. He sees it as a war with NATO and the United States, and he says this all the time. So in this sense, there's no grounds not to believe him. So a transition or a crossing of the boundary in, into a NATO country is a natural step for him and a step in that direction in which he's trying to achieve. He believes that NATO will not respond, and if it does not respond, it will fall apart. And the, the collapse of NATO 
on the European continent is that objective which would suit him perfectly well. I'm asking you this for your approval or not, that if NATO is serious about defending itself, it should defend itself in Ukraine and it give Ukraine everything possible to defeat Putin in Ukraine. I think that defending Ukraine help in the Ukrainians, uh, to the Ukrainians, in help in, in uh, saving their country is the last chance for NATO to solve the Putin problem on not its own territory. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, some critics complain about the loopholes in the sanctions on Russia. Uh, they think we need to put uh, all Russian banks under sanctions, not just the few that we have that we have to make sure that, especially in Europe, especially in Germany, purchases of Russian gas and oil ceases now, although that would be very hard to do. What is your opinion regarding sanctions? Uh, I consider that a part of the sanctions, namely those against the Central Bank of Russia, were, were unexpected for the Kremlin and quite effective. Now, are these sanctions sufficient? It's complicated to say for me. Can Europe today survive uh, a, a, a total uh, uh, non-use of Russian oil and gas? Uh, I'd say probably more no than yes. I think rejecting the need, at, at any rate, of R Russian uh, energy needs to be a, a huge question for Russia, uh, because Russia has been using this weapon more than once, and he will use this weapon in the future as well. It, are the rest of the sanctions reasonable and meaningful, like against the biggest of Russian entrepreneurs? I think yes, despite the fact that these people cannot influence Putin's decision, decisions, but they are tools for Putin, whom he, he uses to solve his problems outside of Russia, or at least make complications for the political assistance of other countries uh, uh, um, who are trying to resist his aggression. What's important is the question of this question. Will the, these sanctions stop right after a combat operations end, or will they stop only after Ukraine's sovereignty is, is restored, which would most likely mean after Putin leaves? That's something Western countries need to decide. But as I feel that as long as Putin remains in power, the risk for the European continent remains huge. Uh, the sanctions have already had an impact in Russia. Um, and of course, that impact will only grow with time. Uh, we've seen at this point tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of, you might say, more liberally minded Russians leaving the country. Uh, what I mean, you, you've been very much involved with trying to pr promote policy to create a new and open Russia over time. What do you see as the impact on Russian society of the sanctions so far? Uh, for now, as of today, Russian society has still not felt the full brunt of the sanctions. For now, Putin has been man has managed to uh, hold the economy, uh, keep the economy su supported, and this has much to do with the fact that the sanctions initially uh, were were not exhaustive; they gradually uh, grew. So, I think that Russian society will feel the full impact of the sanctions in a few months. Um, uh, at, uh, earlier, I had um, 
uh, more optimistic assessments, but now now uh, uh, life has shown other, otherwise. This is important because Russian society does not want to see or hear what's actually going on. And only the sanctions, only their own refrigerator, as we say in Russia, will force Russian society to pay attention and to wake up. Are you concerned that you might say the best and brightest in Russia today are leaving, at least a good portion of them, as a result of this escalation, Putin's escalation of the war in Ukraine and the Western sanctions? This does have an extremely negative side because Russia is losing a significant chunk of its intellectual abilities, uh, of its culture, of the normal leaders of public public opinion leaders. On the other hand, Putin has been hitting these people in a targeted fashion. And by staying in Russia right now, they were would be risking a lot. We have had this in, in our history exactly 100 years ago. Those, the Bolsheviks who came to power then, acted in exactly the same way. They were kicking out those people who could be kicked out of the country, and those who remained, they locked up. I think that the people who are leaving today will return, but they'll return when Putin is no longer in power. One thing we've yet to get to is the whole information space. Um, in the past several weeks, since this new escalation, Putin has shut down the remaining independent media. Um, he's passed draconian laws relating to demonstrations um, and also relating to even the way you can discuss the war in Ukraine, right? You can't use that word Russia, war. You speak of a special military operation. Uh, critics say that uh, the West should be doing more to open, help open the Russian information space. Uh, can this enhanced repression in Russia remain long? And can the West do more to help provide real information within Russian society? Putin's propaganda today is, uh, is, is quite artificial today. It reports to Russians all the, the most horrible facts that you, you can see on your own TV screens, but it spins them otherwise. And the people who are afraid to come out in the streets because they might be repressed and who are looking for some kind of explanations for themselves other than we are cowards, they gladly take these words that they're given and explanations that the Kremlin propaganda gives them. Therein lies our biggest problem, not in the absence of information. What can and must be done is to give more opportunity for communication with Russian society to Russian public opinion leaders there are very many of these people who have now moved to the West because they were afraid of being locked up. And these people communicating with Russian society are capable of influencing public opinion. That's a really interesting observation. Uh, what should the United States, our allies and partners in Europe do to help these opinion leaders Russian opinion leaders who are now located outside of Russia. Any suggestions? Uh, these people, unexpectedly for themselves, are outside their country. They find themselves in a situation where people look at them askance because they're Russians. For them, 
it's psychologically important to sense themselves not outsiders. It's important psychologically for them to feel needed. And if we don't do this, if you don't do this, if other European countries don't do this, there is a chance that these people will either uh, leave the socio-political field completely or might even return to Russia to serve Putin. I think that these Russians, these public opinion leaders who are now forced to leave Russia must sense that they are welcome, that the hopes for the future of Russia are tied to, to them. That a little bit. What, for example, should the U.S. government do to make these folks feel like they are necessary, excuse me, they are wanted, that they have a valuable role to play? And not just the United States, but other countries. Look, these people today don't have jobs. They don't have an opportunity to continue their communications with Russian society because where they earned money yesterday, the social networks, for, uh, among others, are, are closed then. That is the ability to earn money through the social networks. They can't earn because banks refuse to open bank accounts for them. They can't feel themselves normal people because they're not being given visas. They meet, they encounter a situation where between them and the Putin regime, sometimes an equal sign is placed between them and the Putin regime. And if we want these people to be that future of Russia that we all want to see, then Today, we need to be helping them from our side. I mean, myself, uh, the, the anti-war committee of Russia are doing what we can in this direction. But we alone can't solve this problem. There are too many people and their problems have uh, much to do with the positions of government agencies, of the banking systems and with the rhetoric of political leaders here in the West. But you just referred to the anti-war committee, and this is something we should talk about here. Uh, why, why don't you let, let our viewers know the activities you've been undertaking since this new Kremlin escalation of the war, the establishment of the anti-war committee, the different aspects of your work. Uh, when the war began, Every one of us, public opinion leaders, interacting with their own audience, started their, their own war against the war. So naturally, the Kremlin tried to limit our access to our audiences. And that's when we came to the conclusion that we need to unite so that our voice would be louder. We, we united in the anti-war committee. Then we, we start, in, uh, those colleagues of ours began experiencing problems who, are, uh, who, who have been forced to leave Russia. And so we created the Noah's Ark project that helps those who have left Russia. I mean, literally running away from persecution, not having an opportunity to coexist with this regime. We help them solve their current problems in the West. We give them legal advice. We help them with visas. We help them with the banking system. And we provide them with housing in the first stage too. We're trying to help as much as many such people as we can. But as I've said earlier, unfortunately, uh, we, uh, not everything is in our hands or within our strengths to do. Besides that, Russian people, including those who continue to live in Russia, want to show 
their attitude to what's happening by helping Ukrainians uh, who are in such tr- a dire situation. For this, the anti-war committee has also created a project we, uh, that we call uh, Daybreak, Rasvet. Uh, we provide medicines uh, and and food stuffs to the, those who are suffering on Ukrainian territory. And many, very many Russian people, even in Russia, even understand that they might get 15 years in jail for that, are transferring money, trying to help. As you may know, we've done a lot of work here at the Atlantic Council on sanctions. Um, Dan Fried has led our efforts um, very, very ably. And we have spoken, for example, to uh, officials from Central Asian countries who want to make sure that sanctions do not harm their economy. And we have suggested some things. So my question for you is this. We obviously don't want to hurt individual Russians, especially those who are leaving the country with sanctions. So what might the U.S. government and, again, our allies do to ease the burden on Russians outside of Russia of these sanctions? In the U.S., there exist, exists a quite efficient uh, mechanism of removing individual sanctions from people who show that they are not only not associated with this regime, but that they're actually fighting against this regime. I think that an analogous mechanism could could be uh, done, uh, uh, could be created in European countries as, as well, to those countries that are part of the sanctions regime. On, on our side, at the anti-war committee, are prepared to provide uh, large uh, assistance in this respect because we know these people, and 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 those who we don't know, uh, we can find out easily about them. Oh, uh, in a sense, you've already provided some answer to this. But what advice would you give to President Biden to deal with Putin's war in Ukraine and Putin's larger objectives? Uh, unfortunately, greatly unfortunately, today, sanctions alone are not enough. And today, without military assistance to Ukraine, to speak of how to deal with Putin's aggression is impossible. So in my opinion, it's about time to stop with the self-deception that Putin will get upset about more uh, or less active steps. As Putin sees it, he's already at war with the United States. The sanctions uh, in today's uh, today's scale is already war as far as Putin is concerned. Putin is saying that, what, you haven't heard? He says that the uh, weapons shipments to Ukraine are war. What, you didn't hear that? Putin says the training Ukrainian uh, soldiers is war. What again? Don't you hear that? So you're talking. You're telling Putin, "Oh, oh, oh, uh, uh, we're only going to be sending missiles with such a range, but with a longer range, we're not going to see." That's not serious. Putin sees uh, or understands force, and whether this, this either this force is going to be shown, or, or he's going to keep on implementing his plans. I think that Western leaders must finally understand this and set aside this caution of theirs. But that now, following this, and here I think Biden's words were very important, both from a moral point of view and for uh, from a perception's point of view, uh, Putin's personal perception. A person who uh, in the 21st century on the European continent uh, unleashed an aggressive war, who is committing war crimes, cannot and should not rule a country uh, such as Russia. Such a person in power uh, in a sovereign country is an, uh, is a, a constant 
a nonstop danger for the whole world. And to say that we're going to end this conflict and then after that, everything will be business as usual. That is nearsightedness. In my opinion, this is nearsight. This nearsighted gradually uh, uh, is affecting Western leaders. I, I, I or rather, is is uh, Western leaders are slowly losing it. I hope they lose it very quickly. Significant political reform in in Russia require a generational change. And how long might it be before we can see real reform in Russia? Uh, I don't see an alternative for the conducting of political reforms other than a regime change. Putin is, has gone too far on his path to agree to, uh, with, to the necessity, with the necessity of democratic reforms. As long as he remains in power, there will not be any real reforms. Thank you. Um, a question from Anthony Cowden, which you've already touched on a little bit. His question is this, what must happen to convince the Russian people uh, who largely support Putin and believe his version of the current events in Ukraine uh, of the truth that in fact, Russia has invaded Ukraine and have been reputed repulsed by the Ukrainians? We really don't know what proportion of, of Russians understands this and what proportion does not. Because under a dictatorship, people don't give sociologists honest uh, uh, answers in surveys. And I think that the, I think the, the person asking the question would not give such an answer if he knew that he might get jail time for giving a an honest answer. In order to make uh, help people understand what's really going on it needs uh, we need for russian public opinion leaders to communicate with russian society and and in this we can and and should help them a bit now a wake-up call for russian society will be again the refrigerator uh that will be hit by sanctions and now is that time when I say that the sanctions are imperative. Uh, question from Alain Bobbitt. If Putin were to be somehow neutralized, who or which group do you think would be next in line? And would they be different from Putin? Uh, I am sure that any person who would be able to, by himself, independently, alone, come to power in Russia as an individual, no matter how democratic this person is, after a very short time, this person will uh, de-evolutionize along the, the Putinite path to become an autocrat. This is the reality of, of power without checks and balances. So really the only way out realistically is to base oneself on, a, on coalitions. And I think that this is possible because whoever might grab power, whatever part of the elite might grab power after Putin, for them, the key task will be to get the sanctions lifted. And here, the West, if the West uh, acts rationally, will have a strong uh, influence in the question of how the uh, foreign policy tasks of such a new uh, ruling coalition will be formed. It'll be important to use this window of opportunity. This also opens, I'd say, a new insight into what's happening in Russia. Um, critics of sanctions say that sanctions have not prevented this escalation. And of course, that's not wrong. 
But you seem to be saying that sanctions could, on the back end of this war, have a real impact on opening up Russian society, leading to a uh, less repressive and less aggressive and uh, more democratic Russia. Correct? Uh, you are right. But I would like to just add that it is uh, strange to not notice that impact that the sanctions are already having today. A whole range of, of military uh, factories are closed, are shutting down because uh, components are not coming into Russia because of the sanctions. Russian society, uh, its level of, of growing irritation with the sanctions is not allowing Putin to conduct a, 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 a full-fledged mobilization. Th these are important effects of the sanctions today already, and it would be incorrect to not see them. Uh, we have a question from Albert Goldsmith of the Surulin Council uh, think tank in New York. The question is this, to what extent can Putin rely on China politically and for military equipment? Uh, Kita China can, to a significant degree, uh, the, the, uh, uh, replace the West in weapons uh, delivery shipments and in supporting, at some level, uh, the Russian economy. China clearly doesn't want to do this for understandable reasons. For China, peace in Europe is sufficiently important. For China, American consumers are sufficiently important. And to put all this uh, under question because of Putin's ambitions is something that uh, China does not seem to want to do. If China retains such a position, I think that China needs to be viewed not as an enemy, but, but as an opponent with whom coexistence is possible. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm going to go a little bit further on Russia, China. Uh, right now, they are working together uh, against the democratic world. Uh, but it's interesting, even as they work together, you see Chinese journalists you see Chinese um, academics and even lower level Chinese diplomats talk about Russian territory as actually Chinese territory. They refer to Vladivostok as a Chinese city. Are Chinese territorial claims on the Russian Far East understood in Moscow? We certainly see no, no evidence of that from official statements. Uh. <laughs> You know, sometimes I'm uh, surprised by this as well. For any observer, uh, unbiased, it's perfectly clear that the, a, a, cha a change of power in, in China at any moment can lead to it, a, a toughening of their position in relation to Russia and to those claims on Russian territory that a certain part of Chinese society has. What is more, the deep uh, um, uh, dependence on China for uh, um, energy deliveries and uh, to China and purchase of goods from China are being used by China, obviously, or evidently, to greatly discount uh, the price of Russian goods. We see that today. And from my own experience of interacting with Chinese companies, know that these are they're tough negotiators who will never uh, for uh, give up or forsake an opportunity to use their ad advantage. And the and Russia's conflict with the West is an advantage for China. What Putin is doing in the Chinese direction is a dramatic mistake. 
You've touched upon this a little bit, but you have a specific question from Amy Sparks. How do you think Putin will lose power? Uh, will the West NATO be driven to somehow depose him? Or will powerful people in Russia be driven to do that? And do they have incentives to do that? Is this even possible? <laughs> I don't believe in Russian society having the ability today to replace the Putin regime through a uh, people's uprising. The reason is understandable. Russian society is unarmed. And Putin is, uh, but Putin is ready to shoot and has enough soldiers who are ready to carry out such an order. Uh, modern weaponry does not allow unarmed people to resist an armed regime. Replacement of Putin will most likely take place within the framework of a palace coup. And that is quite realistic because those people who are around him understand that with each passing day, with every decision by Putin, they're losing possibilities for themselves. Perhaps those people who are over 70 years old today are ready to live out the rest of, of their days in this cage behind this wall. But those people who are 40, 45, it's perfectly obvious, are not prepared for that, to do that. So I think that one of these days, uh, Putin is going to experience an event he'll never forget. I'd like to thank our audience. I should point out that we have been partners with Open Russia. They helped us do some work on Russia, including a report on a global strategy for Russia. It's called Thwarting Kremlin Aggression Today for Constructive Relations with Russia Tomorrow, which you can find on our website. So again, thank you for a wonderful conversation, for thank working you. with us. Thank you very much. Thank you.